Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Optimizing Weighing and Moisture Determination Workflows in the Chemical Laboratory. I am Kaylee Bach of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Sartorius. To learn more, please visit sartorius.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd now like to welcome our speakers. Celedonio Sines, Regional Business Manager, Asia Pacific at Sartorius, and Wallace Harvey, Regional Business Manager, North America at Sartorius. Celedonio and Wallace, you may now begin your presentation. Great. Thanks for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, hi, and welcome you to this webinar. We would like to take some time to share key concepts about how to optimize weighing and moisture determination in the chemical lab. Also, to highlight best practices for each procedure. Well, let's start by looking about the general weighing side, about the importance of regular calibration and qualification, then requirements for weighing in regulated environments, and then moving on to some tips and tricks for optimizing moisture analysis, the role of sample preparation in achieving optimal moisture content results. And finally, at the end, we will have some time for questions and hopefully we got time for all the answers to you as well. So let's look first on the two main reasons to monitor a lab balance. The first one, is about working with defined tolerance limits. This means that when we have certain limits according to normativity or regulations or our internal operating procedures, the balance or the, the, the in this case, uh, the equipment should be inside these tolerances. And the second one, avoid weighing errors caused by influences from environmental conditions such as um, uh, the airflow, vibrations, and so on, and users or the sample itself or the vessels that contain the sample. The key concept of precision and accuracy involves two main aspects. The first one is the trueness about what we want to measure, and if this measurement tend to the center of the actual value, and the precision that tend to, to be close together or spread apart. So in this axis, we can see trueness uh, in, the, in the Y axis and precision in the X axis. And the, be the best practice will be to have high precision and high trueness. And this is when we can improve accuracy and decrease our uncertainty. As you can see here, the dots uh, improved from zero or less trueness and zero or less precision up to the maximum one when there are all the dots together. So we can define that accuracy is related to both a combination of trueness and precision. And accuracy is affected by the environmental conditions, all, all the aspects around the measurement. Let me start with the, the balance specifications. The, the key concepts here are reproducibility or repeatability, linearity error, off-center load error, and routing error. The first three of them can be also seen in a general metrology, right? So when, when we have the legal metrology in one side, 
related to the World Trade Organization or OML or Legal for Trade Instruments, we, we talk about maximum tolerated errors and the, the instrument will be um, tested for um, maximum tolerated errors as a legal verification and this is according to ISO 17020. When we talk about scientific metrology and, and the relationship between the result and the deviation and the uncertainty, we are calling this certified calibration related to ISO 17025. When we talk about normative metrology, like um, the metrology that you can find in, in, in according to a norm in certain industries, we can see that this metrology uses one or two of these balance specifications. For example, the USD Chapter 40 or the European Pharmacopoeia 2.1.7 talks about reproducibility, repeatability, and linearity error. And the last one of the metrologies, industrial metrology, is the combination of the previous ones. So all of them calls these balance specifications and that's why these tests are very important. Then we have environmental influences to the measurement and the behavior of the balance, such as temperature, humidity, location, leveling, and so on. And this means everything that is affecting the instrument performance. And the last one, effects from samples, vessels, and users like fingerprints, like hygroscopic samples, or magnetic effects. And these are, these are the, the factors that affect the sample behavior while weighing. By testing the accuracy, we can find this concept of reproducibility or repeatability test. Uh, in a simple way as the standard deviation of the instrument and can be calculated with 10 measurements and the behavior of the instrument should be something alike this uh, standard deviation curve where we expect to have 97% um, of the results inside this section of, of the, the arrows below then 95.4% will be in this section according to more or less two sigma. And in one sigma, we can expect 68.3% of the results. So the instrument will react or will show it, the, its standard deviation by this test. And we can say that this is the most important specification of a balance because with this one, we are going to use several other errors around the balance and also the normative metrology can use this one for further calculations. The next one, we can imagine in, in this graph, the value displayed and the nominal value of, the, of a weight, of a test weight, or, or the mass that we have placed in, in the weighing pan. And if, if we placed 100 grams, we expect to see 100, 100 grams in the display. So this line is the characteristic line of this measurement according to the test value. If we have certain deviation of, of this idea line, we can call it um, the the linearity or linearity error. When, when we see only one curve, we can say that this is the second order, a second order error. And when, when we see a cut of, of curves, um, like, like, like sinus signal there, we can, we can start counting the cuts and, and this will add another order to this equation. So the, the biggest error will be the, the distance in between this ideal line up to the curve. This deviation have, has a, a big influence on the measurement and 
For this one, we use a weight set in order to test from the mi minimum capacity up to the maximum capacity. And we can draw the entire curve of, of the balance. Also, the balance uh, is, is, is an instrument that will receive uh, the, the loading in, in, in the weighing pan, but uh, the system can expect that this, the, this weighing will, will be not every time at exactly the center of the weighing pan. So uh, we call the off-center load error to precisely this deviation in between the value that we can obtain by weighing at the center of the loading pan versus, in this case, each of the corners of a balance. It's not exactly in the corner, it's in the, in the center of, of this square, imaginary square of, of, of the corner. And we are not going to add errors. It's this, this test shows the maximum value of the maximum deviation in between the, the load in the corner versus the center. And the last one is the rounding error. This error means that the last digit uh, sometimes fluctuates or sometimes moves um, in between the rounding of, of the system. What is this? For example, here we, we have this four and a change of this digit is not visible in, in from us, right? But um, it means that if this one this one changes to five, could be in, in the last decimal, could be four, three, or two digits. So we, we don't know exactly what's, what's after this uh, last digit. So we can say that uh, in, in a rounding error could be, in this case, an error of 0.5 digit. And now moving to the environmental influencing factors, we have this small picture that shows in, in, in a general way um, this laboratory. And we have here the, the biggest eight or the most common eight factors that uh, affect the balances, or in this case, the, the weighing procedure. So first we have the opening of doors, we have hustle and bustle when, when people walk, uh, humidity, unstable tables, in, uh, imagine that the balance is there and the weighing table is not stable. We have vibrations also, the sunlight that affects directly the temperature of the instrument. We have open windows that creates this air draft or airflow to the balance and we say that the worst one is the air conditioning system when it's just above the system, the balance, because it goes directly to it, to the weighing pan and the balance will, will transform this force of the air into a value of mass that it doesn't exist in, 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 in reality when we talk about the sample. So it fluctuates the, the real value of the mass. Talking about temperature, we know that temperature modifies the volume of a sample, right? So it also modifies the, the, the volume of the balance itself. So when we have these sudden changes in temperature, the balance also expands and contracts, yeah? And the value of the mass is different. So because of the air buoyancy effect, the balance and, and the sample seems to be or lighter or heavier. And in this case, when it affects the instrument, can affect the electronic components. Our components have this uh, maximum uh, tolerated uh, range of temperature operation. And when we exceed this operation, the electronic systems will present errors as noises inside the, uh, could be the 
digital or analog transformation. We suggest to maintain stable or constant the room temperature that will affect the sample and also the instrument. Avoid uh, AC exhausts as we saw in the previous picture. Also, windows uh, direct sunlight to the instrument. Um, also, this proximity to radiant heaters, ovens, or, or any heat source, like lamps, for example. And also, uh, computer's ventilation fan can affect directly the instrument. We suggest also to minimize direct contact with sample or weights with hands, or, 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 or we, we suggest to use always forceps or tweezers. And minimize using your, your, hand, your hands inside the trap shell because also the hands modify the, the inner environment of the trap shell. And it causes an additional heat source of, of inside the weighing chamber. Well, once you have your balance installed and you unplug it from, from the energy source, the balance needs some time to get stable readings. And here you can see the timing for each balance is according to um, the readability. For example, precision balances uh, with readability uh, below, uh, sorry, above uh, one milligram up to a gram, it takes more or less like 30 minutes. Analytical balances, the, the classic balance in, in, in any lab with 0.1 milligram of readability takes more or less four hours to, to have these stable readings. And up to micro balances that needs uh, 24 hours to, to have really stable readings. So what we suggest is do not disconnect the balance from the power plug, keep it always with energy, but in the standby mode. So during nights, the or after work, or or during any any weekend, the balance is not going to consume that amount of energy. When 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 you are actually using the balance in the standby mode, the balance keeps itself um, ready just to turn on and and use it. So you don't need to have this extra warm-up time. When a balance suffered this change in temperature that we that we talked uh, from from previous slide, we can also um, draw the effect of this drift with um, the displayed value against uh, the nominal value of of a weight and. As, as the previous test, if we place uh, 100 grams, we expect to see 100 grams in the display. And when, when, when we change, for example, here, five Celsius degrees, we can see a difference in between the, the, the value of the mass. And we call this error as sensitivity or, or temperature drift. Um, the, in, in, in the data sheet, you can find this drift in parts per million. Uh, so less parts per million means that the instrument reacts less to these changes. More parts per million means that the balance is very sensitive to these temperature changes. In this case, for example, we have two parts per million when, when the balance displayed 0 0.001 grams in difference against the nominal value of 100 gram weight. The humidity plays or or plays two games in in a common weighing procedure. When when we don't have humidity, is bad for the sample because it is easy for samples and vessels. Or, or containers to 
charge uh, static electricity, and it's very difficult to ground this static electricity. So the sample keeps this energy, and it's difficult to ground it, to, to, to take it away. But when we have these high humidity conditions, it's also bad because condensation may occur. So the, the, the balances and, and, in general, the weighing instruments must have this range of humidity between 45 up to 60% of humidity. Also, in, in calibration labs for weights, this is the range that they use for calibrate weight or, or, or the mass weight. So it's easier to have or to keep this traceability up to the, the national standard, regional standard, or international standard by keeping the, the conditions of the lab stable. Unfortunately, vibrations are common in any lab because of heavy machinery, because the street outside the, 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 lab, the lab, because of motors in, inside the lab, because of passing planes or, or even earthquakes. In, in the case of micro and ultra micro balances, earthquakes are, are, are visible in, in the readout of, of any, any, any weighing procedure. So in order to avoid the impact of these vibrations, what we recommend is to have a, a very uh, strong weighing table that uh, will absorb this, this shock of, of force and immediately uh, goes away. So uh, avoiding damps and, or, or, or these soft materials that could keep this force inside is our best recommendation. The winning table, as, as I mentioned, uh, as big recommendation would be a very strong one, heavy or, or, or solid one, because when, when we have tables that bend or, or, or they are placed in, in, a, in a wrong place in, in, a, in a lab, for example, um, in the middle of the lab, also the floor can bend. So this affects the, the weighing procedure and the readout of the balance. So we recommend to have the best location of the of the lab for a balance, and this could be a corner of a room um, near to a load bearing wall um, in the lowest floor level as possible, even sometimes if it's possible in in, in basements for for calibration labs, and avoid to place this uh, near to high traffic areas. If 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 the lab can be moved in into another location away from streets, we recommend to do so. And frequencies um, of, of these vibrations should be avoided if they are higher than 10 hertz. Otherwise, we can, we can reach some resonance uh, cycle of, of the materials of a balance. And this is a high frequency with with, with much power, we can really damage some parts of the instrument. Use granite tables and sartorius balances have excellent filters for eliminating interferences. We have four filters, usually in each um, weighing system. And also we suggest to um, put the balance away from walls uh, and floors with, with high frequencies. Once the balance is already installed, it's common that we need to clean the balance and we move the balance uh, to, in order to also clean the, the base of, of, of the weighing table so or the surface of the table. So we have to always remember that um, a leveling inclination can cause these two components of forces and the real value of the of the mass that we that we are uh, measuring it's a component so in this case we show that uh, in order to obtain the, the value of the mass we have to multiply the display value against the cosine of the angle that we have there and at, as, as 
this example shown, we have displayed a wrong value of of the of the mass. So remember to always keep level the balance in the center of of the of the bubble target, and this will help you to always be precise and accurate. Another issue in with when when you move your instrument from one location to another, from a point A to B, with a difference of, of height, um, is that the balance needs an adjustment because the gravity in between these two points because of the height difference is also different. Uh, in, this, in this example, we have here uh, a difference of four meters, 13 feet, and this will present a difference of 0.3 milligrams. And in this calculus is 0.26, rounded it's 0.3 milligrams for analytical balance, it's three divisions, and this is the limit for some uh, maximum tolerated errors in, in, in analytical balances. So with this only four meters, we have an error in, in the readout. And the the it's even worse when we transfer a balance from different cities so uh, higher higher uh, altitude will will result on on higher error of the balance so um a, a simple adjustment of the balance and and return it to to the true value will help on precise and accurate results. Thin lines with reduces disturbances because some samples that are spilled also attract, in the first case, some dust. Yeah. And in, in the worst case, it also damages the material. So, for example, here, stainless steel, when, when, when we spill some material there and it's difficult to clean afterwards, and and we need um, to use some other chemical agent, we are going to damage the surface of the high polished um, weighing pan or stainless steel in this case. And after several ones, we can see that dust can be allocated there and further cross-contamination also can appear. So we recommend to use an absorbent, uh, absorbent cloth to remove liquids uh, to be, in order to be gentle to, to the stainless steel. Doors and weight pan uh, sh should be also or can be also placed in dishwasher. Um, we recommend uh, to use the top rack. And never use heavy brushes. Or, or a handheld vacuum to, to remove residuals. Uh, if it's necessary, remove the weighing pan. And if you can see that uh, it's, it's not possible with these tools to clean your balance, call uh, our technical service to do the proper cleaning of the balance. Otherwise, you can da really damage the inner system. We have also samples that interact with the environment, such as the hygroscopic samples or those samples that uh, evaporate. And in this case, uh, for example, uh, hygroscopic will, will absorb moisture or water from the environment, and the, uh, the samples that evaporate will give moisture to the environment, give, will give water. And in, in that case, we suggest that uh, ever touch a sample with your finger or, or bare uh, hands or bare fingers, use gloves, because in, in this case, or, or anti-magnetic forces, forceps, because uh, the fingerprint has also this fat, and it fat, this fat weights. And, and it has a 0.4 milligram uh, weight by minimum. And this one is also hygroscopic. 
So in this case, uh, we can see if you have a container or a vessel with uh, a lot of fingerprints, this will react more or less as hygroscopic or, or evaporating sample. So please avoid to use bare fingers or bare, or, or, or bare hands. Please wear gloves or forceps to manipulate your samples. We talk about temperature uh, and, and evaporation in the previous slide, and we have a, a very interesting effect when we are not weighing at the same temperature as the environment. For example, if we are weighing above the, the environmental temperature, which means the sample is warmer, it, it means that the sample has a different volume than if, if it was on environmental temperature. With this difference of volume, as we mentioned in the past, with the air buoyancy effect, the sample seems during the time that it, it's cooling, it seems like it's gaining some weight, right? So uh, as, as this mentioned, warmer samples appears to be lighter than they really are. And exactly the opposite effect, when we have cooler samples, it looks like they are heavier than they really are because when when they warm, they are losing, sorry, they are expanding its volume and they are uh, losing some weight. So what we recommend is to be repeatable, to achieve repeatability. Um, you can wait uh, at the same temp temperature always or wait up to the environmental temperature. It's difficult in, with some specific uh, standard operating procedures, spe especially when, when, when we expect some reaction or, or when we are testing some uh, other processes at that temperature. So keep in mind that this temperature will affect the value of the, of, of, of the sample, the value of mass of the sample. Keep the record of the temperature if you can, and the best practice is to wait until the sample is at the same environmental temperature. Magnetic effects are also possible to avoid if if you want to or if you need to estimate the, the the value of the mass of the sample we can we can use several tricks like using a hook and weighing below the balance and in this with this trick we are placing the magnetic field as away as possible from the balance because the balance also has internally another another magnet in the coil. What we can see when, when, when we placed a, a magnet in the weighing pan is that the values are stable, but they are not repeatable. And sometimes we can see a small drift if, if the, 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 the center of the magnetic field is exactly at the center of the, of the, of, of the magnet that we are weighing. So what we can do to prevent this is to increase the distance, as I mentioned, weighing below. Or you can perform the magnetization of the sample. You can use uh, some other metals uh, as, sh as a shield for, for the draft, for the weighing pan before placing it into the draft shield. And also you can use uh, special anti-magnetic weighing pans. Static electricity affects the sample and sometimes affects the vessel of the sample. Um, when, when we have these positive ions in, uh, surrounding the, the sample or the vessel, we can see that the, the sample acts as they are lighter than, than they really are or heavier than they really are when, when, they are, when the ions are negative. Um, so the problem is 
that this can occur without notice or it is because of the environmental conditions such as low humidity in your lab. In that case, you can raise the humidity of your lab and you can see that the sample will ground easily. So our best recommendation is to eliminate this kind of charges. So use an ionizer, increase humidity, or also use a metal container or metal foil to detect these electrostatic charges. Now, moving to the requirements of, of weighing in regulated environments, we have this big question about how often do we need to calibrate our balances? We know that according to the ISO 17025, the balances should be calibrated on, on, on this established uh, time, more or less should be once a year, and this is because we want to minimize the risk of erroneous measurements and fulfill the required process of accuracy at any time. But the real question is about knowing this deviation of the instrument. So the timing in between each calibration could be defined according to the procedure or also can be defined by the instrument. If, if a first calibration shows high deviation, then you perform an adjustment and when you verify this adjustment, you can see an error again and also with another calibration you see a deviation again, you need to increase the, the timing in, in, for, for each calibration in terms of more calibrations to the instrument in order to keep an eye on it. Uh, what we define as calibration is exactly what I, what I said. Take care of the deviation and also know the uncertainty. In order to know the uncertainty, we need um, a certified calibration. A verification is when when you test the balance and you said it pass or fails with calibration you want to know this deviation it's not only to know if if it fails or or passes it's also to know how much it deviates and when and with with how much uncertainty the adjustment allows you to eliminate this difference and we suggest that the balance must be adjusted if temperature changes, because this maintains accuracy of the balance. And we, we also recommend to use always external weights when uh, calibrated external weights. And when you use internal calibration, you can, you can choose by, by do it, in this case with ISOCAL, by certain amount of time or when the system feels a certain deviation of the temperature. Here, here you can see an example of the difference in between internal and external calibration. We have a target of, of value, of the mass value, and when we see some drifts or when the balance feels these drifts, the balance, the balance itself calls the, the inner calibration system and pulls back the value to the target value. It can happen up and down because of changes of temperature or it, it can happen because we are not using the bands. So in general terms, we say that compensates temperature fluctuations, also changes in humidity, or when you change the balance from point A to point B location with, with different height or, or different altitude, and also it compensates aging effects. If the balance is uh, old, the, the balance will need 
frequent internal calibrations. And external calibrations uses external calibration weights. Here we have some pictures of calibration weights. So, uh, the, our best suggestion for you is never touch with your bare hands or fingers. Always use forceps. For balances, we need higher accuracy class of weights. So gloves are not really recommended with this high, calibration, high class of calibration weights. And the recalibration of weights, um, there is no written frequency, but as, as mentioned in, in ISO regulation, uh, we suggest every year there. And if, if after several years you have no changes of it, um, you are doing a great job with your, with your, with your weights. Remember that the weight tolerance are typically categorized by class. So I, I mentioned these uh, high class uh, weights, and those are class zero, class one from ASTM or OML class E2 F1. Um, class zero and class E1 regularly are only used by calibration labs, or in order to calibrate E2 and, and class one. So commonly for instruments are class one and class E2. As recommended, a balance should be calibrating using a weight uh, according to its class tolerance, right? And uh, in, as an example, a balance with readability of 0 0.01 grams, a semi-micro balance may be calibrated with a weight having known tolerance of at least 0 0.009 grams. Another practice is for, for challenging your instrument or giving a powerful calibration uh, range, certified calibration, is to identify which is your working range. We suggest these three test points near to the minimum range, up to the working range, and near to the maximum. Near to the minimum because it's close to the, the readability of the instrument, near to the working range, because over there you can see the, the, the deviation of your instrument according to your common procedure with your common amount of mass or sample, and near to the maximum, because if any error happens there, this error will mean a lot of mass and also big loss in costs when you are using samples at that limit. Typically, we know that this working range is around the 10 or 20% of the maximum capacity. And you can do it regularly, or you can ask also to your calibration lab According to the ISO 17025, it's possible to challenge your balance, test your balance, and calculate the uncertainty value in your working range. Also, we recommend to have not only a, an upper intervention limit or this maximum tolerated uh, error for a balance when once you are verifying or, or performing this standard verification of your instrument could be every day or, or every week or every month. Instead of that, we suggest to have a limit called warning limit for you to use your uh, tools that could be an internal calibration or an external calibration and then a, a, an adjustment. So the balance will keep always this range near to the target value. And once we have reached this upper limit with any measurement, you perform a calibration. And if it doesn't work, 
you can call directly your technical service to perform some maintenance to the balance or repair. And with that, we are sure that in your process, there is no chance to get bad results above the intervention limit or your maximum tolerated limit. And now we are going to turn on moisture. So Wallace, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Celedonio. Appreciate that. Um, so we're gonna shift gears a bit here and transition into talking a little bit about uh, tips and tricks for optimizing moisture analysis. So when we talk about moisture analysis, I guess the first question that comes to mind is, you know, what is it that we are actually referring to? And uh, generally speaking, you know, when we talk about moisture analysis or moisture determination, we're, we're really referring to all the different variety of methods that are out there for determining uh, the level of water content um, in samples, whether it be trace amounts or high levels, and these could be in any types of samples, right? So it could be solids, liquids, gases, what have you. So, um, and it's very critical as we know to do this because moisture has a big impact on a variety of different aspects when it comes to final product, but also in the manufacturing process itself and the quality control. So what are some examples of different industries that uh, are doing moisture analysis? Um, this list is, I'm sure, obviously much longer than what you see here, but just to, to give you a few examples, obviously it really covers a wide gamut, anywhere from uh, plastics and med devices um, to things like paints and coatings. Uh, it's used very heavily in the automotive as well as the food and beverage industry, um, petrochemical, wastewater, um, you, you name it. Um, pretty much every industry is doing some sort of analysis because Water is such a critical factor um, in terms of, like we mentioned before, some of its impact on results, finished product quality, manufacturing, and so forth. So kind of transitioning into that, you know, what uh, are the, some of the reasons for looking at moisture content? Why are we actually doing this? Why is this important? Well, it, it really varies, you know, depending on industry and application area, but I would say the primary reasons for this kind of fall into uh, a few different categories. So one of the uh, the big reasons for this is obviously product quality, right? So water content moisture can influence things like taste or the texture if it's a food product, mouthfeel. Um, if you're looking at uh, products that are in the pharmaceutical or petrochemical uh, area or even food and beverage, obviously it can impact things like microbial growth, uh, shelf life or expiration dating when it comes to products like this. Um, also stability and integrity. So, you know, how the products will last and, and how long they will hold up. Um, in addition to things like consistency. So that's a big aspect as well as, as customers want to make sure that the product is the same from, from one time to the next. Another key area that's important is production. So when we're talking about moisture content or water content, it can influence things like product uh, flow through different types of equipment or packaging, um, minimizing things like delays because of how long it takes to dry a sample due to the water content can also be a factor. Um, and also throughput and waste um, reduction are also uh, very closely tied to water content levels as well um, to uh, eliminate problems and issues in these particular areas. Legal uh, is another important aspect, obviously, because you know certain products are going to be required to meet certain specifications, um, and this can be definitely tied to their moisture content. So, what they're labeled for, it has to match up, and this could be, you know, whether it's federal, state regulations or local uh, regulations, particularly when it comes to things like food and chemicals and, and wastewater. And finally, certainly not least, cost, right? We know that water is a, is a relatively inexpensive ingredient compared to other things that may go into the mix, but maximizing the water content or controlling it accurately um, is definitely gonna be critical because you wanna verify that they're gonna be within the proper limits, right? So that uh, when you're purchasing, you wanna make sure that uh, you're getting um, the best for your dollar, both as a, a consumer of the product, but also when you're going to uh, sell it, since many products are sold by weight or by concentration level. So I thought first we could do just a brief overview of some of the different available methods for water determination. There's quite a few out there. Um, if we kick it off first with Carl Fisher titration, we know that that's a very popular technique 
used in quite a few laboratories for water determination. Um, some very good advantages in terms of it looking for water to the exclusion of all other types of volatiles, but it can be a little bit expensive sometimes, particularly depending on the type of equipment you may need to measure certain types of samples. And of course, um, there are chemicals involved, which, which can be considered hazardous. Um, if we kind of shift over to loss on drying or the vacuum oven method, um, again, this is very often used in, in testing for moisture content. Um, sometimes it can be a little time consuming depending on the uh, moisture level in the sample and how much sample you may need, um, but it does have the advantage of not requiring any hazardous chemicals. Mass spectrometry is, uh, is also used in some occasions. Uh, typically, you're looking at more expensive equipment here to perform a test like that, but um, it also does require a certain amount of expertise to interpret and operate the equipment as well. And then and finally, we have moisture analyzers, right? So these are very commonly used uh, for moisture determination. Uh, thermogravimetric technique, no hazardous chemicals involved, and typically they're, they're relatively easy to, to operate and interpret the results from. So these are some of the most common techniques that are used, and uh, we're going to focus today uh, a little bit primarily on loss on drying and, and, and moisture analyzers in our discussion. When we talk about loss on drying, I think one of the most common uh, forms of moisture analysis, it's kind of interesting because there's quite a bit of aspects involved there. Um, what we're talking about here primarily uh, when we think about that concept is really taking an initial weight of a product and then heating it for a period of time and then taking a final weight. And then you're determining the moisture content by taking the difference between the two weights to really calculate that uh, amount or percentage of moisture. Now with a traditional oven test, you know, this typically requires heating the sample over a somewhat longer period of time. Sometimes it can be up to even several hours um, at a fixed temperature. Um, and there's different AO AOAC or ASTM methods that kind of establish what these parameters could look like. Um, and typically it's always uh, sent back to or, or referenced against a reference standard or method um, to really determine what's the best length of time to get the optimal results for different types of samples. Um, Oven test results are typically not available for some length of time because a lot of the time it may take, you know, several minutes or even hours to get results. And so oftentimes they're not the best uh, source of a resource for getting, you know, pretty quick results, especially for moisture analysis in real time. Uh, we have, on the other hand, rapid uh, loss on drying moisture analysis uh, techniques. And these typically provide results in minutes rather than hours, right? So the, the optimal situation there is that you can use these a lot in the production process and other areas because they tend to be faster in terms of getting results real time and they have rather user friendly uh, methods of analysis. When we talk about uh, these rapid uh, LOD methods, you know, typically what we're looking at here is uh, measuring the weight loss, but it's not necessarily specific to just water. There could be potentially other volatiles involved uh, besides water because you're only looking at um, the weight loss that's taking place. So if you do raise or lower the temperature of the analysis or change the sample size or adjust the endpoint setting, you can get different results um, with the same sample. So that's why it's very critical to make sure that you're calibrating or setting up your rapid methods against a standard reference method like Carl Fisher or like some other techniques uh, like the oven method. And this is very easy to do and most of this information is available in the literature um, and we can help you with that as well with, with our application support. But primarily, you know, if you're looking at these standard reference methods like Carl Fisher um, or an oven method, you can get those, those reference values fairly easily. Now the question then becomes, well, how exactly do I do that, right? How do I adjust uh, a moisture analyzer to match the reference result, right? So I can get accurate values and, and appropriate levels uh, determined. Well, there's primarily three main variables you're going to look at to do this, right? And uh, this is what we're going to focus on here, what those three variables are. The main ones are the temperature, the sample size, and finally, the endpoint setting that you establish for the particular rapid LOD moisture analyzer. With those three combinations of things, it makes it very easy to pair up or adjust your um, instrument to match the standard reference method and get accurate results. A couple other things to consider just when you're making these sorts of adjustments is just taking a look at what sort of accuracy is required for your particular method, how, how close to the true value do you need to make sure that you get, and also how quickly do you need the result. 
um, this can also have an influence on the overall um, evaluation and your method SOP development. When you're prepping a sample for a loss on drying measurements, um, this is a very critical area of the whole analysis because it can greatly impact the accuracy of your test results uh, and actually the time it takes to get those results as well. So typically, you know, when it comes to doing this, the samples themselves are going to fall into really one of three main categories, um, liquids, paste, or solid materials. And we're going to talk a little bit about each one of those and how to get the best results when you're doing moisture analysis. So this is a good time to kind of segue into that, you know, to talk about the role that sample preparation actually has in achieving the optimal uh, results for moisture content. So we'll kind of segue into that at this point. And, and like we mentioned, you know, sample prep really is critical when it comes to analyzing samples for loss on drying, um, regardless of what type of sample you have. So uh, one of the key things to sort of remember is to really try to make sure that you homogenize the sample first before you take any uh, of it for analysis. And whether that involves mixing or stirring or taking multiple samples from different places within the vessel that you're obtaining the sample from or at defined intervals, whatever you can do there to make sure you have a good cross section of the material for analyzing will help you get uh, more consistent results. Um, secondly, making sure that you're taking the samples from a sealed airtight container um, so that you're not allowing uh, any of the sample to be altered or in any way uh, contaminated by the environment is also something that's critical and important as well. Um, finally, the storage container itself should not be too large or too big because you can have uh, moisture from within the container actually interacting with the sample. So you want to keep the size of the container that the sample is taken from commensurate with how much sample is actually contained in that vessel. And then finally, um, it's just good to keep in mind that moisture, you know, can condense on the walls of the container that the sample is kept in. So you may need to consider uh, mixing that back in with the sample before you take measurement or just otherwise taking that into account that that can happen. And again, that can be minimized by remembering to keep the uh, sample container uh, as only as big as it needs to be to, to maintain the volume of sample you're going to be testing and looking at. When it comes to um, liquid samples, um, again, we've got some key tips here as well. One of the key things to remember is to really make sure you keep the sample isolated from the surrounding environment so that it's not picking up um, or having any uh, potential impact on the sample itself. Uh, this is really critical for liquids um, because they can, like I said, pick up moisture from the atmosphere if they're, you know, uh, capable of doing that or if they're um, temperature-wise different from what the surrounding um, environment is as well. It's important to sometimes stir or shake the sample before testing. Again, to kind of get back to making sure that it's homogenized properly for the best results. And then most of the time, if you are going to use a filter pan uh, or a filter pad rather inside the pan, um, it's very important to um, keep in mind that it's good to maybe make a sandwich if you can between two filter pads if you have a liquid, especially if you start to notice like a skin or something like that forming on the top of a liquid sample. Um, it's good to kind of use that sandwich method. And then finally, uh, or one of the other things to consider is, is making sure that you pipette evenly onto the pad so you don't have too much sample concentrated in one particular area. You want to try to keep it as evenly as distributed as possible so that you get, you know, really the best results. And then finally, but certainly not least, is, is making sure you run the analyzer at um, the proper standby temperature so that the sample doesn't lose moisture during the loading process. Um, that's critical as well. You don't want to drive off any moisture before you actually start measuring for that um, in any way using the instrumentation. Now, when it comes to solid samples, again, there's also some good tips and tricks to keep in mind, and we're going to cover a few of those as well. Obviously, like before, you want to isolate that sample and really keep it from interacting with the environment. Um, another good way that gets back to that whole concept of homogenizing and making sure you've got a sample that's evenly distributed in terms of size and so forth is grinding it if necessary to improve the accuracy and the repeatability and the speed of testing. If you look at some of the illustrations there to the right, you can see that uh, you've got samples there that are very consistent in terms of their size and um, their relative to each other, which is uh, of critical importance. Again, that 
even distribution within the sample pan is, is going to be critical for best results as well. And that's kind of illustrated here. So you don't want to have like clumps off to one side or a concentration in one specific area of the pan like you see to the right here. But the best is going to be if it's really even and level and consistent throughout the weighing pan to get the best results. And then really, you know, as a rule of thumb, the last thing to kind of keep in mind there is the, the higher the moisture content, um, the really the less amount of sample that you're going to need for a test. So sometimes we tend to err on wanting to add more sample to get a, I think we need to get a better result. But in most cases, that's not always the case, especially if you have a higher levels of moisture content in the percent range, for example. When it comes to um, paste or samples that are pasty, um, again, same sort of precautions, you know, in terms of isolating from the surrounding environment, um, stirring the sample to make sure you can get the best possible homogeneity, and again, using that uh, sandwich technique to really uh, improve the accuracy uh, when you're dealing with certain types of samples to get the best repeatability as well. So something that looks like what you see here, a very even distribution of the sample between two filter pads is the ideal situation that you're looking to have. Uh, when you're looking to test different types of samples. And certainly uh, one of the things we always like to mention just to have everyone keep in mind is that, you know, we do support uh, and any customers that are looking into performing this types of, of testing. And we realize that it can be a challenge from time to time optimizing that methodology. So we have an applications method development team that uh, works very closely with our, our customers and our, our field support team to provide not only trial instruments for testing in your laboratory, but also customer support around methods development, which we've done for thousands and thousands of samples. So feel free to give us a call or a shout if you have questions or needs in this area, and we'd be happy to support you as well with our, with our application support team. Um, other than that, you know, I just wanted to make sure everyone is aware that we do have quite a few um, information available online on our website when it comes to applications and solutions for uh, chemical testing environments, both for uh, all types of laboratories, and feel free to check that out at the link here. And again, we thank you for your time today, and I would say we're pretty much finished with this portion of the presentation, and if there's any questions or comments or things you'd like to discuss in more detail, uh, now would be the time to uh, maybe dig into that. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you, Celedonio and Wallace, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. All right, let's get started. Our first question is, does the internal weight from internal calibration have a calibration certificate? Okay, um, well, interesting question. Um, no, it, it doesn't, has a, 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 doesn't have a, a calibration certificate. Um, internally, it's, it's, it's a mass, and um, this one has a certain value from, from the factory, and doing, by doing the internal tests, the, the balance is challenged against um, uh, a proper calibrated um, mass. So the, the final value of it, it's an internal value just for reference, tested in several uh, different temperature values. So um, it's, not a, it's not considered as a weight per se because it, it doesn't follow any, any uh, shape um, norm international norm it's it's just an internal mass for for this internal calibration thank you very much for for, for that question thank you all right our next question asks when performing calibrations is using the internal calibration isocal feature better than using external weights for calibration I think I can take that one also. Um, the, when 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 you 
perform an internal calibration, the, the balance will show the deviation of, of this internal calibration. So um, by testing the balance against uh, an external calibration with an external uh, weight with, with also a, a, a calibration certificate, um, you can also see this deviation, right? Um, in the case that this deviation is, is different, right, um, in, in, as, as the question mentioned, I think that it goes around that maybe is not the, the suitable class for, for, for this instrument. And it, it happens often. Uh, sometimes the, the, um, the, the weight that we use for, for challenging or testing the balance is, is not a suitable one for, for doing it. So, so uh, my best recommendation is um, you, can, you can perform these um, this calibrations, external calibrations with um, the same class from, from your calibration lab or just one below, right? If it's an E2, you can you can use an E2 or an F1, but uh, usually the balance will be um, will will use internally the reference with uh, the the best class according to 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 the readability of the balance. Great, thank you, Celadonia. All well, right, next, oh, go ahead. Okay, our next question asks, when I have a new or unknown sample to measure for moisture content, what is the best way to develop a method using a moisture analyzer without wasting samples? Okay, I can take that one. So yeah, there's a couple different things you can do there to, to help with optimizing that. Um, one of the first things to do would be to take a look at the uh, weighing range on the moisture analyzer that you're working with and also its readability. So uh, many of the units have different readability and different capabilities in terms of how low and how accurately they can measure uh, sample weights. So in that particular situation, especially if you're working with limited amounts of sample quantity, you would want to look for a moisture analyzer that has um, better accuracy, better readability down at some of the lower sample weight levels. So that would be a help. Um, secondly, I would say definitely rely or consult with our moisture um, team because we, like I said, have tested tens of thousands of samples. So there's a big chance, a good possibility that we've already measured your type of sample or something similar to it. And we can help you out with parameters and suggestions and settings for where to start so that you don't um, waste sample and waste time. Um, and then the third and final one I would just uh, recommend is there are some different types of sample analysis procedures that you can follow to help with difficult samples. Um, one particular method that's sometimes helpful in this case is called the spike method, where if you're not, not sure of the moisture content of your starting sample, you know, you can spike it with known quantities of moisture and then look for the additional uh, weight or the additional water that comes off in the form of the sample uh, the moisture itself combined with the spike that you added, and then you can kind of determine that way uh, how much moisture is there. So there's there's a lot of different techniques, and, and we can help you with all of those, and, and uh, those are just a few suggestions. Thanks. Good question. Thank you, Wallace. And I want to send out one more reminder to our audience to ask any questions now if they have any. Um, just drop them into that Ask a Question box on the far left of your screen. We've got some great questions coming in here. Our next one asks, how quickly can moisture analyzers perform an analysis and still return accurate, repeatable results? That's a good one as well. Um, typically, you know, once everything is optimized, you can get results for most samples within just a few minutes. And by that, I mean anywhere from three to 10 minutes or, or less. Um, it really is just a factor, like we said before, of optimizing both the temperature, the amount of sample that is being used, and, and the uh, settings on the instrument. So um, with those three parameters, you can uh, really dial in that time and get results pretty repeatably um, and in real time with your samples. So uh, it shouldn't take any more than, than just a few minutes once everything is, is optimized. Wonderful, thank you. 
Our next question here asks, what if I can't wait for the sample to acclimatize to the environmental temperature? The Wang readout is wrong. Okay, I can take that. Um, yeah, uh, when when you have no time to wait because of your procedure, what we suggest is to care about these two main factors. One is 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 the the value of the mass, and the second one is the the temperature value, right? So, um, if if you keep this value again and again and again with with your uh, as as a, as a standard operating procedure for this particular uh, test you can be you can be highly repeatability or repeatable and also you can reach accuracy the value of the mass you know will be according to this procedure right so if you want to to have the real value of the mass you have to do uh, some calculations with with this difference in temperature, with a small correction in density, uh, against the the um, uh, a common calibration weight, and the the relationship with uh, its density. Right? It's it's not that complicated. So you can you can have the the value of the mass, or you can wait to to have the the um, the accurate results with uh, environmental temperature also with uh, the same as your sample. Great, thank you gentlemen for these detailed answers. Looks like we have time for one more question here. And this last one asks, I have to weigh some syringes and pipettes that are filled with material. They tend to roll around or move when I try to weigh them directly on the weighing pan. What do you recommend for weighing samples like these? Okay, I can take that one too. Um, yeah, we have uh, for these cases um, uh, a sample uh, weighing pans, uh, especially for syringes, and it, with with syringes and and pipettes. Uh, in, in in terms of weighing, we can also consider to to modify the um, say the the parameters of the balance in order to have a dosing a dosing weighing where each drop um, really matters and so we have this these two these two solutions right if you want to weigh the 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 syringe itself um you you can use um an an, an accessory which is a, a, a syringe weighing pan or if if you are using syringes and 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 pipettes with 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 your procedure by dosing we have the 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 solution in in our balances for uh dosing dosing weighing so the balance will will change itself and will care of each value of each single drop dosed in 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 the vessel or in in a vial or whatever Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to thank um, Celedonio and Wallace again for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank Labroots and our sponsor, Sartorius, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>